Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with folks that I've connected with in the world of arts and entertainment over the years. And today I'm very glad to have with me musician and author and all-around storyteller, John Gardner. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, Tommy. How are you doing? Well, you know, we're still surviving this zombie apocalypse for now. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's good to be able to talk to people anyway. So, John, I know that you are sort of a renaissance man and you've had your hand in a lot of things, but let's start with the music. What got you started in the music as, a, as an actual musician? Well, as you mentioned, Tommy, like I'm, I'm also a writer, so I'm going to just read you a little piece of one of my stories to sort of describe that. But I will tell you that I was walking down the hall at James A. McGee Public School when I was four years old in kindergarten. I started kindergarten when I was four. And a big hand went on my shoulder, and it turned out it was the school janitor, Bob Esser. Bob Esser was also the junior town band leader in Hanover. Like, we had a really vibrant town music scene in those days. And anyway, Bob uh, said to me, he said to me, I was a little kid, he said, both your grandfathers were in the town band. He said, you can probably play. And before I knew it, he had set me up with a clarinet, and I was playing in the junior town band. And... When I was eight, I moved up to the senior town band, and uh, believe it or not, I used to have to go on parades with these guys, and I was eight years old, and I'd have to run to keep up with those guys. But I played clarinet till I was 12 or 13, played in a lot of Kiwanis music festivals, you know, won a bunch of certificates. So not a bad little clarinet player, but then as you and I were just talking about before we went on air, February 9th, 1964 happened, and uh, myself and friends saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and clarinet's not a cool instrument to have uh, in a rock band, so I had to make a little bit of a switch. So here's a little bit of my fiction to describe how I sort of got started in the music business. All right. I first started playing the guitar as a peer thing. Some friends and I decided to start a rock and roll band. Like it was the way to win girls and influence people back when I was growing up. At one time in the small town where I grew up, in my neighborhood alone, there were three garage bands practicing, all with dreams of making it big, of hitting the big time. I got my start on an old Sears Silvertone six-string guitar with only three strings on it. Bob had actually taken guitar lessons, so he was the lead guitar player. Mike had money, so he was the drummer, and Brian had none, so he was the singer. <laughs> I had no money either, but Mike was my best buddy, and he had the old silver tone guitar with only three strings on, so I was the bass player. We added Delbert on rhythm guitar because his dad had a station wagon to transport our limited musical equipment around in, but he never really fit into the group. The first song was a Stones thing, Get Off My Cloud. And from there on in, we could handle just about anything with only three chords. We'd listen to a potential new song on Mike's mono record player. And if Bob could pick out the key and even some of the chords, we were away. I'm sure looking back on it, that we were completely awful back in those old days. But our friends would let us set up at their parties and sort of ignore us as we mercilessly butchered song after song. Then they'd tell us how great we sounded. But the best part were the jams, and that's how we got better. To the point where we probably actually weren't too bad to listen to. We'd spend whole weekends holed up somewhere jamming the blues. I'm not sure to this day who started us doing it, and maybe it just sort of evolved because most of the old rock songs are basically just the blues. But we jammed the blues for hours and even days at a time. It was a heck of a good time. Not much structure, but a lot of substance. Freedom to do what you like as long as you stayed within the pattern. And even then, nobody really much cared if you went for a wander. It's the way life should be, but it ain't. There you go. There's a little description of how I wandered into the world of rock music. (laughs) Very cool. Now, I know that you're a left-handed bass player. So I'm just curious, when you were a kid in school, did they try and make you use your right hand? When I was in grade four, Tommy, I ran into that with my teacher, Mrs. Danker. 
She tried to switch me from left to right. She was old school. She was an older Scottish lady, and she was old school. And she just sort of thought I'd have a lot easier time of it in life if I was right-handed. So she did try and switch me for the first couple weeks of school, and my dad eventually had to go over to the school and have a little talk with the principal and her and straighten them out because, you know, obviously being left-handed is not really a big detriment in life, I don't think, anyway. My younger brother is left-handed, and he kind of had the same treatment in school. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon back then. You know, Tommy, when I started to play the guitar, it's really sort of interesting. Like, I just started playing it the way it felt natural to me. I didn't even realize sort of that I was playing it wrong, like backwards, until I was already in a band and we were playing. <laughs> and then it was too late to switch. Like, you know, I, could just, I just didn't feel I could relearn everything and do everything all over again. I've often wondered with playing the guitar left-handed and backwards, because I don't switch the strings, right? They're on upside down. I've often wondered if that somehow changes the sound of the band. I don't know. That's a good question. Hmm. You know? Very interesting. Yeah, well, certainly, I know that I've used alternate tunings from time to time, and any kind of little change that I've made has certainly affected my output musically. So. Well, listen, I'll tell you something. I've played with some really ace guitar players over the years. None of them have any idea what I'm doing on the bass guitar. (laughs) They they all look, you know, like usually you watch each other, you know, and I can watch a a right-handed guitar player. I know which chords look like what, you know, so I can follow them pretty well, but guitar players have an awful time figuring out what I'm doing. Yeah, well, when it's upside down, it's not quite the same because normally if I want to see what my bass player is doing, it's like looking in a mirror, right? Because... yeah. But, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, man, you and Jimi Hendrix, a couple of weirdos. Oh. Yeah, right on. <laughs> not, not, not bad company, though. Eh? Not bad yeah. company, you know, like, holy crap. Yeah, no kidding. So I do know a little bit about the Sterling Blues Band. I understand that you, the band, was uh, in the finals for the Road to Memphis by the Great Lake Blues Society. So... How did you guys get involved with that, and how did it ultimately turn out for you? Well, I am, as, as my little excerpt from my story indicated, um, you know, we, I kind of learned how to play the guitar and grew up playing blues. And I'm sort of sad to say that in the sort of mid to late 60s when we were playing blues, we were covering stuff by uh, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and the Rolling Stones, and they were our blues bands at the time. And then Blues bands became groups like Electric Flag and uh, Pacific Cats and Electric and all those California bands that, uh, again, they were just canned heat, fundamentally blues bands. And I don't know, I just, like, I sort of grew up, like I say, playing the blues. And so I played in a lot of cover bands. I played in country bands. I played in every kind of band. About, I don't know, about maybe 15, 20 years ago, I sort of drifted back into the blues. And uh, I got to tell you, I've played in a number of blues bands since then. The Sterling Blues Band, hot band. Like Tim Sterling, lead vocalist, just really, really, really hot vocalist. Uh, Odd Paul, a great guitar player. And a good little rhythm section, I think, with me and the drummer. We've had a couple of drummers, but really, really good little band, I think. And actually, Tommy, we, uh, we won the Queen Street to Beale Street contest in Concordia for the uh, Bruce County Blues Society. And we went to Memphis in 2015 and played in the International Blues Challenge. So that's a pretty big thrill for a small town guy from Hanover, you know, like got to play in Jerry Lee Lewis's club for two nights in the competition. And uh, I got to tell you, there wasn't a bad band there. Boy, it was, it was just amazing to see the amount of talent there. And, you know, when we were driving back, there's no question, we were a little bit intimidated, especially the first night. When we were driving back, you know, my wife said the most important thing she said to me the whole trip. She looked over at me and said, John, you sounded like you belonged. You know, like like we weren't going to win that thing, you know, the International Blues Challenge. But I think we acquitted ourselves pretty well. Like, I think we did okay, you know? Yeah, very nice. I haven't been in all that many competitions. It's just not really my thing. But uh, I was my band was invited to play a set at Yuck Yucks in London, and the the, uh, deal was that whoever won was going to open for Sloan at the Western Fair. Right on. I'm always a little bit intimidated by these things, and like I say, that's one of the reasons I don't particularly get into entering contests or competitions, but 
I remember sitting there watching a couple of the bands and going, oh my God, how am I going to compete with this? And yeah. we won. Life yeah, is funny. Well, yeah, you just never know. I mean, when we walk, first walked in to the club down in Memphis, you know, for our first night of competition, we'd do 25 minutes set each night. And we had uh, 10 minutes for changeover between bands, right? You had five minutes to get somebody off and five minutes to get on. Uh, and uh, 25 minute sets place packed like just packed to the rafters you can't even imagine we walked in the first night kind of trying to squirm our way through with our instruments and stuff like that well the band that was on when we walked in i mean you know just a phenomenal black check could have been tina turner on vocals you know like and just amazing bands there it was just stunning to see the amount of like so many great great players and so many great bands around you know like uh it's just it's really heartening and even, you know, some young folks, too, like, uh, you know, young folks are uh, trying to, you know, play their way through life. And, you know, I, I give them credit for that. I feel sorry for them, Tony, because there's not a lot of places to play anymore. That's true. And I was just thinking about your neck of the woods and how we used to travel up to Hanover and Blythe and whatnot in the middle of the winter. And uh, there were always a lot of gigs up that way. Now, you're living in Wallaceburg currently? Yeah, I'm down. I've been here for, I'll be 36 years this year, so I've been here for a long time. Yeah, there was a bar in Wallaceburg that we played a couple of times, too. Wallaceburg had an enormously happening bar scene back in the day. I mean, there were four or five bars in town that were all bringing in some form of entertainment or another. You might have played at Sam's, which used to be called the Weber. You might have played at the Wallsburg Inn, which was uh, right uptown on the river. There were a number of different bars in town that were booking very vibrant music scene. Of course, all gone now. Like, I think we have one club in town now, the CBD, Canadian Belgian Dutch Club. I think they were booking bands up till the pandemic. And of course, it's a big worry right now, Tommy, when we get out of the pandemic or when, when we finally start to loosen restrictions, is whether all the people my age, and I'm going to be 70 next year, maybe have gotten too used to sitting in front of Netflix. You know what I mean? We got to hope people are just going to sort of rush back out and uh, get this music scene, this whole entertainment scene reestablished, you know, like get it going again. Well, I'll tell you something. I've been saying all along during this, and especially as we got to the six and seven month point, that I believe once we open the world again and music, live music comes back, that people are going to come back with a renewed enthusiasm and vigor. And I'll tell you something. I talked to Crystal Shawanda couple of weeks ago and they have already played a blues festival in Kentucky and she, right she told me that uh, and they were the first band on and uh, she said that during sound check people were starting to trickle in and even then people were dancing and when it came yeah. time for them to actually do their show she said it was so emotional she sang so hard she couldn't talk for days yeah. afterwards yeah. so at that I thanked her for that good news yeah, I'm really hoping you're right. I mean, I have been the programming guy for the Wallsburg Arts Council for about the last 30 years. I'm, I had sort of retired, and I was thinking I wouldn't do it anymore, but I think I'm going to try and run a series this fall and next winter uh, one more time anyway, just to provide some employment for a lot of these musicians who are going to need some work, you know what I mean? If yeah. I can even get it for anybody. I mean, maybe everybody will be just snapping everybody up like crazy, you know, I don't know. Hard to but, say, but I've got some more good news on the live music front, and I found out yesterday that the London International Rib Fest is a go on the Civic Holiday Weekend in August, and this will be the first show that I've played since February 2020. And yeah. I, when I talked to the guys, everybody was just so, so overjoyed at the prospect yeah. even of playing yeah. a live show again. And I really think this is going to be... It, I don't want to be too cliche, but kind of like the Roaring Twenties. Well, I hope it is. Like, I really hope you're right. I hope people will just get right back out there and embrace it. I don't know. It's just, it, it's, you know, being on Facebook, and I have a lot of musical friends, you know, over in the Toronto area, and certainly it's been depressing to watch club after club there close up, you know, over this pandemic. And I really hope that there'll be some, you know, people will get re into I really hope you're right. Like, I really do. I want... Uh, you know, it's really interesting. Um, Rick Fines, who's a good friend of mine, and, and uh, I brought him in here a bunch of times. Well, great blues guy. Nominated for a Juno, actually, for his new album. 
But anyway, Rick summed this up on Facebook one time, maybe a month or a couple months ago. He said, well, who this is really affecting is the middle class of the music industry, the middle class, okay? And what he meant was like the really big people, they're doing fine, okay? They're going to keep doing fine. And the sort of amateur people on the bottom who, I don't know, play are willing to play for whatever amount of money they can get, or I don't know what I'm saying here. They're okay, but it's all these people in the middle who have been, you know, working as professionals, professional musicians. I don't even know how they've survived some of them. I have no idea. You know, like how you just go from, you know, some type of income to none, you know, well, like for a I, year and a I half. I think we're all lucky that, and I'm not going to get into politics here, but I think that we are very fortunate that we have the federal government in place that we do and that we're being supported that way. So we're very lucky uh, yeah. on that front. But, you know, when it comes to successful musicians, there are so many artists that I've spoken to and I've met and shared stages with over the years who have insisted on making a living from the music, and that's the be-all and the end-all, and they you know, yeah. they just expect that they're going to become billionaires and so on. And the most successful are the ones who have had day jobs. You know, I... I talked to Rob Reiner and Steve Lips Kudlow from Anvil, and something a lot of people didn't know about them, even when you watched that documentary, they had day jobs all the way through the first 13 albums, and that's how yeah. they were able to devote the time and the energy into the music without burning out. Yeah, yeah. So No, no, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, listen, I'm a writer primarily, okay? I couldn't sell my creative writing. I never have sold much of it for much of anything, whatever the reason. I mean, you know, my writing goes over well and is popular with people, but for some reason I've never found a publisher and never succeeded in that regard. I mean, I've worked as a newspaper man for almost 40 years because you got to pay the bills. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, so I mean, it, well, while I was working as a newspaper man, I wrote 150 short stories, three novels, a few plays, uh, several musicals, like lots of stuff, you know what I mean? I mean, I didn't sort of quit just because, I, you know, I was getting, I have a couple box fulls of rejections upstairs in my attic. But you know what? If you believe in your work and you believe in your stuff enough, that doesn't matter, you know? Like what you've got to sort of feel is that it just isn't the right time or the right, I don't know how to describe it, but like you can't get discouraged, you know, like if you believe in your art, you got to keep pushing it, keep moving it out there. Yeah, well, you know, I've read some of your stuff. I have right in front of me right now, I have your book, Memories for Sale, Tales from a Small Town, and it's quite good. I think that from the sounds of it, you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, you, you do it because you love to write and that's a way for you to express your creativity. And I'll tell you, this book, I assumed that this was going to be somewhat of an autobiography. And it's really, it's, it's short fiction stories. I'm curious now, you, you're pretty prolific with your uh, true life stories, posting them on Facebook. Have you put any of that stuff together in one book, or are you going to do that? Well, what I'm doing is, like, Memories for Sale is a total work of fiction. Now, apparently, I didn't really realize this when I wrote it. And mind you, I wrote it over quite a number of years. Like, that's kind of, a, kind of a collection from over the last 30 years. It's in Memories for Sale. But, I mean, I didn't realize, but I guess there's a lot of me and a lot of Hanover in that book. I've been told by people from Hanover who know me who've read the book. You just, there's just, and I didn't really realize that while I was writing it or whatever. You know, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to describe. It's a, it's a difficult uh, thing to do to to try and you know to be a professional writer. There, there there are hardly any of them in Canada. You know, like there just aren't. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do in Canada. I don't know why. Um, lots of people reading, and I don't know. It's it's a, it, the publishing industry struggles in this country. They just do. Well, being in the arts in Canada is a struggle. Period. Yeah. So back to the question. Do you plan on putting together true stories? But first, this very important public service announcement. Hey, you know, I got my first dose of the vaccine, and I really think that if we want to get summer back, get our festivals and our live music back, we need to get our first dose. If enough of us do this, we can have our freedom back. Yes, do this. 
And I know a lot of my famous friends agree with me. Hi, this is Earl Johnson from Moxie. I know we've got a lot of friends and fans out there in the upper ages. And uh, believe me, get a shot, get a vaccine. I did recently, and it gives you some peace of mind because nobody knows how the world's going to change even further. Thanks for that, Earl. Now back to John, who was about to tell us if and when he plans on publishing his true stories. Actually, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I've got a book in the works right now. It's the memoir. I wrote a memoir maybe three or four years ago, of sort of from birth up till the time I was in my early 30s, till the time I moved here. And I've tried to make it kind of amusing, like kind of, you know, anecdotal, like just little stories of stuff that happened to me while I was growing up and things like that. And Anyway, what I've decided to do for a new book is I'm, I'm going to... Uh, Put a good chunk of that in a new book. I'm going to publish a new book called Emotional Thoughtscapes. That's what it's going to be called. And the memoir is going to be called something like The Life and Times of an Upside-Down Left-Handed Bass Guitar Player. <laughs> so I'm going to run a big chunk of the memoir, but I'm also going to run 10 of my short stories. So, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be, uh, uh, again, a sort of a literary collection with the memoir and the short stories. I was just going to do the memoir, Tommy. And then I thought, no, I got it. Like I don't know when I'm. I'm self-publishing this stuff, and it, it's expensive, as you know, when you do your own stuff. Yeah, a book is particularly expensive, and I, I can't do this forever. Keep self-publishing my stuff. Obviously, I'm still hoping to catch the attention of a mainstream publisher, a traditional publisher, who will help me get my work out. Because really, at this point in my writing career, time I always joke with people these days. I don't care to be rich and famous anymore. I'm way too old to chase starlets and go on cocaine binges, right? <laughs> I just want my work out there. You know, like, I've had a couple little cancer scares, and uh, I don't want to die with all this work on my computer. You know what I mean? Right. I believe my stories deserve to live. I think they deserve to breathe and live. And the only one who's going to get them out there is me. Like, I realize I'm a little heavy on the Facebook post, but I'm pushing this stuff for all I'm worth, okay? And uh, I got to get it out there. You know, and again, it's not about rich and famous. Or, in fact, I don't even care anymore if I get any money out of these stories. You know, really, I don't. Yeah. It would be nice. I mean, it's great to get some fiscal reward. The main reason it's nice to get fiscal or financial reward for your art is because a lot of people in our society, don't take your work seriously unless you make some money. That's right. true. It's not a good thing, but it's true. Maybe we can help to get some of it out there in front of people. Where can people, how can people contact you to actually buy your books? Well, the easiest way to get a hold of me is through my website, which is johngardnerstories.com. And it's John Gardner, is G A R D I N E R, johngardnerstories.com. Tommy, I. Like you, I put up a podcast every week, one of my short stories, not from the book. This is the original unpublished fiction. I do a podcast every week. I have a blog up there every week. It's really interesting. Do you know who Gerf Morlix is? I'm at a, at a loss right now. Okay, Gerf's sort of a famous musician, but he, he's in the Americana field, the field of Americana and old country. Okay. He lives in Austin, Texas. He helped start Austin City Limits back in the 70s. He's toured with Warren Zevon. Believe it or not, he turned down Tom Waits' tour so he could come up to Canada to his cottage one summer. He's sort of a famous guy. Anyway, he uh, loves my writing, and I love his music. You really should expose yourself to a bit of it at some point. But anyway, he he sits down there, and I, it's just such a cool thing having the website. Like, I wrote a blog last week about the, that whole middle class thing in music. Well, Gurf saw that, and he... He posted the link on his timeline or whatever, and he's got like 5,000 followers. So my website kind of went off the charts for a couple of days. But, you know, it's just amazing how the new technology happens. I, I don't get it. I'm an old guy. I, don't, I just don't get it. Yeah, well, the Internet either works for you or it works against you. I'm still dazzled by television, okay? So, uh, <laughs> you know, modern technology is way over my head. But uh, I love how you can share stuff around, like how you you, for example, I love you, the posts you make where you just you know, do a tune 
And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. It's sort of what I'm doing. You know, I post a little excerpt from a story or something like that. And we could have never done that. Like, imagine going through this pandemic before the Internet. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I started this podcast in the first place to try and give people something to look forward to in an otherwise very troubling time. Yeah. And I'm not making any money recording myself doing cover songs, but I don't care about any of that. I yeah. just feel like we need, as artists, to try and lift the people up. And yeah. that's my sole purpose. For And I don't expect to ever make all the, the thousands of dollars I've invested in recording projects. I don't expect to ever make that back. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when people are asking me, when are you going to make some more music, you know, I just feel like it's an obligation. And I'm in a situation yeah. where I'm not rich, but I'm not destitute. And I am going to keep making my music for the love of the music until I can't yeah. do it anymore. And I, yeah. like I said earlier, I think that you're writing for all the right reasons. People are being entertained by your uh, posts on Facebook. See, that's why I'm doing it as well, Tommy. I don't know if you knew this or if we hadn't got connected first, but when the pandemic first started in April of 2020, I started reading stories on Facebook Live, and I did it every Wednesday and Saturday night. I read 60 stories, okay? And that's the only reason I did that, was to give people, and I had some people there, everyone, you know, like, uh, that's the whole reason I did that, was to give people something to look forward to in the pandemic, exactly that. So I can really identify with that, and I just think, I know that's sort of our job as artists, is to... Uh, kind of keep the morale up, I guess, when, when things are tough, you know, like, it's like Tommy in the old days when I used to play in a lot of bars and stuff like that, and a big fight would break out, right, a huge Donnybrook, like chairs flying and tables, and what did the owner of the bar always ask you to do, Tommy? Keep playing, man, keep playing. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget one night, um, way back in, must have been around 76, 77. One of my early bands were playing. We were playing at a wedding reception in Bonfield, Ontario, <laughs> lovely township of Bonfield, Ontario. And out of the blue, now we were thrashing our way through ZZ Top Tush. Okay, yeah. And there aren't too many songs that are, are a better musical backdrop for a Donnybrook. I tell you, no, so no. Out of the blue, this guy just starts punching people. Yeah, and yeah. We don't even know what. So. We actually stopped playing because, like I say, bum ba da 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 You know, that's a good one to, to, to go with. But uh, it, ultimately, our drummer's sister's fiancé was a trained boxer, and he knocked the guy out outside. But, I mean, we've seen our share of violence in the bars and that, and it is what it is, but, you know, the show must go on, and the people need their entertainment. Now, speaking of shows and entertainment, what is the hippie reunion? Oh, okay. Well, well, back probably around the turn of the millennium, back around the year 2000, we had an old friend pass away from the old hippie days, and uh, prematurely, obviously, he was only in his early 40s. And anyway, his daughter, he lived way out west, up north out west in B.C., and his daughter mailed me his ashes and said that I should uh, dispose of them in the Hanover area because that's where her dad had grown up. A few of us, six or seven people, we got together... Uh, up in Hanover, and we dispersed the ashes, and we got chat, and we thought, you know, we're not getting any younger, you know, we're like, it's going to start happening a lot more often, you know, people are going to be dying, and which they are, obviously, in these days, but we need to get together, and start getting, we're not going to see each other anymore, so we started this event in Hanover, me and this other guy, Ian Mills, and we, uh, what we do is we rent the park uh, on Saturday, the Hanover Town Park, and uh, we just throw a a little bit of advertising, not very much, and uh, anybody, any of the old hippies, and really not the old hippies, we want anybody who grew up in Hanover that just wants to see a few familiar faces again for a day to come on back to Hanover and have a good time, you know, like, and uh, and every year we try and scramble some music, we have no budget, right? we get no money, so every year it's up to me usually to try and piece some band together that can play, at least get things started. And then we usually have enough musicians show up that it turns evolves into a jam. And uh, anyway, so I'm back at it again this year. I just making some calls yesterday, and this year I'm working on a real extravaganza. Well, I should mention, up until last year, the sort of the house band at the Hippie Reunion was Strange Brew. 
which was my old 60s garage band. Somehow I lured those guys back out of retirement. And uh, we were actually active in Hanover in 68 and 69. And uh, then we had a 42-year break. And then we got back together again for four or five years. So it's pretty funny. But anyway, uh, I'm putting a band together for this year. And God, I'm trying to get a horn section together, Tommy. I don't know if I can do it or not. Hmm. But uh, it's just a fun thing. It's just a thing for people to come and visit, you know, like, there's nothing very organized about it, you know, we're old hippies, we don't organize stuff very well, you know? Right, yeah, what was I doing? Oh yeah, something shiny. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so, I'm I'm curious now, is this an all-ages event, like, do people bring their kids out? Well, not usually small children, no, not really a good environment for that, I mean, you know, there's a bit of drinking and that, we rent the campsites up. The people can go down to the campsites to have a beer or something like that. We don't actually have a liquor license, but I don't know. I, I guess kids, are, I don't know. I've never really been asked that. I don't think I've ever seen any kids at it, but probably not. Probably more of an adult event, not that there's anything particularly nefarious going on. Well, but. I was just curious because uh, a few years ago, I decided I was going to quit playing the bars, and I will... I will possibly play a bar if it's at a, like a, the London Music Hall or something where it's a large yeah, yeah, sure. and the people sure. are there specifically for the music. But my main love uh, when it comes to live shows anymore is playing outdoor festivals. And oh, I yeah. get great joy out of seeing little kids up at the stage dancing oh, sure. and along. Oh, sure. Yeah, you know? yeah. And my neighbor has a son who is eight years old and he has a copy of my greatest hits uh, Tommy solo in the 21st century CD and he loves it yeah and yeah one day I was out back and we live in a townhouse complex and there's a, a kids playground right behind our unit and I walked out uh, with the dog and I was wearing a kiss t-shirt and one of the kids says oh we love kiss and I said what you yeah, guys yeah. seriously yeah we love kiss and we like Led Zeppelin I said my god there's hope for humanity you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love to see kids getting involved and in, enjoying the music, and that's oh, that's yeah, a, yeah. It's a big thrill for, sure. for me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, no. That beer reunion we've been running there, like I say, probably almost twenty years. And in the first few years, it was really not very well attended, and really didn't work out very well. But we hung in there. And one year it poured rain in the early days, and uh, there were six of us there sitting in the shelter, and uh, that was it. But lately, we've had a couple hundred, two, three hundred people coming out the last number of years. Until last year, we obviously didn't have the event. But so we're optimistic. The town of Hanover is actually partnering with us this year, which is the first time that that's happened. So what I'm a little worried about is if all the lockdown ends and we're one of the first events to happen, it's making it a thousand people. I don't think we're equipped to handle that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're going to be in for a pretty decent turnout one way or the other. Well, yeah, we didn't want to have it. It's, it's late in September, like September 25th. We didn't want to have it that late because the weather concerns, but uh, we're really trying to push it back as far as we can, try and get clear of the COVID thing. Right, yeah. Well, cautious reopening. Let's all hope that works. Uh, John, I don't have any more questions for you, but I do like to give my guests the last word whenever possible. So is there something in particular that you feel passionate about? Well, Tommy, first of all, I want to thank you for doing these podcasts. I mean, I, I know you've been nominated, I think, in the builder category in London, have you? In for the, the contributor category, yes. The contributor. Anyway, that's well deserved, you know, because you're doing a great job here keep helping keep music alive. But I'm going to tell you that uh, I'm kind of passionate about everything I do. I have a saying, you know, we can't all be great people, but we can all strive to be great at what we do, you know, at everything we do. You know, and I sort of believe that. And my dad kind of, you know, my dad kind of drilled this thing into my head, which is just do your best, son. Always do your best. And I really think we all need to do that in our lives. And uh, I just think, I don't know, Tommy, I, we're all in this together. I read Buckminster Fuller back in the 60s, okay? And he's the guy who invented the geodesic dome. But anyway, Buckminster said at one point that we're sort of all like passengers on spaceship Earth, okay? We're hurtling through space on this big ball of dirt and water. And uh, we're all here together. We're all in the same, same boat. 
And well, actually, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in different kinds of boats. That's part of the problem. Some people have yachts, and other people have rowboats. We're all in the same storm. <laughs> okay. But uh, I just, I really believe that. And uh, the theme song for the planet should sort of be All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. And we should start taking that stuff just a whole lot more seriously. I guess that'd be my final word. That's awesome. Well, listen, John, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk to me today. And until next time, cheers. Cheers, Tommy. Well, there you have it. Another fun interview. John Gardner is not just an upside-down left-handed bass player who writes stories and books and so on. He's a pretty cool cat for an old hippie. Now, without further ado, here is the Sterling Blues Band live with Someday You're Gonna Have to Pay.
those cold green eyes, baby. I know all about it. Someday you're gonna have to pay for what you did to me. Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including producing, editing, guest acquisition, etc. All rights reserved. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends was written and recorded by Tommy Solo with a little help from my friends in the night crew. And hey, if you like the show, why not subscribe? Until next time, cheers.